Okay, so you're here for some great church leadership content. The podcast is great, but there's also another piece of content you need to be enjoying each week. It is the Leading Saints email newsletter. Now I get it. Email newsletters feel so 2006, you know, but it isn't as old fashioned as you might think. It's actually one of the most popular pieces of content that Leading Saints produces. Each week, I share a unique leadership thought that can only be found in the newsletter. I keep it short and sweet. Most can read it in less than five minutes. And then we share with you recent content you might have missed, throwback episodes, and Leading Saints events that happen more often than you might anticipate. If you want to make sure you are on the email list, simply visit leadingsaints.org 14. That's leadingsaints.org 14. That will also get you 14 days access to our full library of content not available to the general public. So look for Leading Saints in your inbox by going to leadingsaints.org 14 or click the link in the show notes. Before we jump into the content of this episode, I kind of feel it's important that I introduce myself. Now, many of you have been around a long time. You're well familiar with my voice and with Leading Saints as an organization. But if you're not, well, my name is Kurt Frankham, and I am the executive director of Leading Saints and the podcast host. Now, Leading Saints is a nonprofit organization dedicated to helping Latter-day Saints be better prepared to lead. And we do that through, well, content creation like this podcast and many other resources at leadingsaints.org. And uh, we don't act like we have all the answers or uh, know exactly what a leader should do or not do, but we like to explore the concepts of leadership, the science of leadership, what people are researching about leadership, and see how we can apply them to a Latter-day Saint world. So here we go. Today, I'm headed back to Alaska through the powers of the internet to chat with Sarah Randall. How are you, Sarah? Hi, great. Awesome. And you're in Anchorage, is that right? Yep, I'm in Anchorage. I am Sharon Kay's backyard neighbor. We have a That's ladder right. over our back fence. Oh, really? Wow. Mm-hmm. Outside of Utah, I mean, do you have very many neighbors that are that close there in your ward? Or? Not that often. We've lived in a lot of different states. I'd say this is the most that are in our neighborhood. We have three families in our neighborhood. Nice. Now that's a throwback reference to an earlier episode I did, a How I Lead episode I did with Sharon K. Fisher, the Relief Society president in your ward, and uh, had some really insightful perspectives and thoughts. And uh, you listened to that, emailed me and said, hey, I think there's more we could explore from your perspective of being one of her counselors. Is that right? Mm -hmm, Exactly. Nice. And was there, were you like listening to it thinking like, oh, Sharon Kay, she's not saying enough, like or, or <laughs> screaming at yeah. your, your podcast player? Yes. She's so awesome. And so um, just has such a beautiful, simple way of leading such a quiet, but powerful way of leading that really listens to the heart. And yeah, every, everything in that podcast, I was like, oh, that's so awesome. And then I would think of like five more things that would add to the depth of that. And and she's not one to toot her own horn. So I wanted to toot her horn a little bit. Yeah, that's (laughs) the interesting... That's the interesting thing about this segment we do. You know, we want to find good leaders to talk with and explore, but good leaders are generally humble leaders. And, you know, few good leaders are looking to get in front of a microphone and talk about their leadership experience. So, uh, so sometimes maybe they're not as, uh, eager to, to share other points, but you know, mm-hmm. uh, I think Sharon Kay did a awesome job. And so does she know that, that we're doing this? Or is this going to be a surprise when it pops up in her podcast feed? Well, I mentioned to her the process of what happened because of all these thoughts that were coming as she did her podcast. And I was like, what, this is okay. Why am I having all this? This is silly. This is yeah. just, uh, but then it kept coming and then I'd wake up and there'd be more <laughs> thoughts. And then I'm like, okay, Heavenly Father, if you really want me to do this, then like help me know for sure. And then I went to the temple that morning and I didn't know, I didn't have any plans to meet anyone there. And I went in and the only seat left was in the back next to Sharon Kay. Nice. <laughs> Love it. 
Love it. And we talked a little bit about it and I was like, okay, Heavenly Father cool. likes us out of our comfort zone. Here we go. Nice. And um, well, let's just talk about you briefly, put yourself into context here. Are you originally from Alaska? No. So uh, I grew up in Utah. I graduated from Utah State University and my husband graduated from University of Utah. And then um, I served a mission in the Portugal Lisbon South Mission, which at the time included the Cape Verde Islands. Loved it. Want to go back. Their temple just got dedicated this weekend, which I am so thrilled about. Yeah, that's cool. I wish I was there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so we uh, got married and moved to Iowa um, in 96. And um, we've lived in a lot of different states since then. So our whole married life has been living in Iowa, Pennsylvania, a little bit um, Texas, and then now Alaska for 11 years. Nice. It was there a, something specific that took you to Alaska other than the gorgeous scenery? <laughs> it is gorgeous. Um, we, when we were living in Oklahoma, we had our sixth child and I just, something clicked and I was like, I want to play with my kids outside. And there's a lot of ticks and sugars in Oklahoma. And so I couldn't really do that as much as I wanted to. So we just started looking around and there's a lot more to that story. It's kind of a really long story, but God led us to Alaska. We'll just say yeah. that's the short answer. Man, well, I've had the opportunity to visit Alaska many times. And uh, if God led me there, I probably wouldn't argue too much. <laughs> so but that call has not come yet. So yeah, it's so great. We we backpack as a family kayak. I just got back from a kayaking trip. It's so beautiful. Awesome. And then you were, were you Sharon Kay's counselor for the whole time of, of her service as a Relief Study president? Yes, I was her first counselor um, for the whole five years. And that was such a blessing. And I was coming off a really difficult experience and um, the bishop wasn't sure if I could um, do a big calling like that. And it honestly was healing for me. Oh, cool. Nice. And uh, so let's jump into just a few points here, uh, starting off with just the way that your presidency went about not making ministering overwhelming. How did what did that look like and how would you break that down? Well, it was interesting because that change happened during our presidency. We had a lot of big changes happening. We were just released last year. So we were, you know, the, all the different changes, every general conference were like, okay, presidency meeting tomorrow, let's jump in. And how are we going to make these new changes happen? And so, um, we, we noticed that there was a lot of baggage, a lot of guilt trips with visiting teaching. And like, I, I, it's all or nothing. I either go and I'm like the perfect visiting teacher and I bring the cookies and I do all these perfect things or I'm not good enough. And then I don't do it. And then I'm a failure. Mm. So we found there was a lot of baggage and things that first needed to be just listened to and, and, um, uh, I guess cleared up. And so when we started doing the ministering interviews, we didn't call them interviews. We just, um, said, Hey, could we, we would text like, Hey, can we just touch base about how ministering is going? Mm. And then we would do a phone call or meet at church, whatever worked for the sister, because we were trying to make it not so formal that it was like, <gasps> am I doing all the checklist? Oh, yeah. I'm, it's, it's my moment to report. Here we go. Yes. Right. Okay. Now I'm terrible. I need to repent. <laughs> and so instead we were just like, we just want to touch base with you about what's working and what's not working. Hmm. And that phraseology we found really helped a lot because it, it enabled the first thing we'd always say is, how are you doing? And sometimes that would be a really long conversation that would open up stuff that we had no idea that mm -hmm. they would pour out their heart. And sometimes it didn't really even go to the ministering interview because they had a lot on their heart that we listened to. And then, you know, we'd say, is it okay if we share this as presidency or what could we do to help or different things? So, so did, did that mean that you typically meant one, you met one-on-one -on -one rather than with the companionship? Um, so when we did the interviews, the person, so we, we divided up the, um, you know, the, all the ministering interviews, we divided them up, um, by three in mm -hmm. three groups. So president, first yeah. council, second group, we had our group that we interviewed and we would just do that on our own interview. Um, and that we would line it up. Like we text, Hey, can we meet? Can we call meet after church? What works for you? And so that's how it was set up. And then, um, from there it was, um, it either turned into a, a big conversation, how you're doing, or it was like, what's working, what's not working. And sometimes mm -hmm. there would just be logistical things. Like I work in the day and my sisters want me to come in the day and that doesn't work. Okay. Well, we'll make a change. Yeah. Yeah. 
Interesting. Anything else as far as simplifying the ministering effort and not making it overwhelming? Well, Sharon Kay, I just love how she does things so simply and real life, right? Like she didn't have any like, 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 um, complicated things. She would go to presidency meeting and she pulled out this trifold board. Like, you know, you have the science fair and you have yeah. oh, cool. <laughs> trifold. So she uh-huh. would set that up. She had this little high chair from her granddaughter. So she would set that cardboard trifold up on the high chair. And it was again, divided in those three groups. So it was my name and the sisters under me that I interview and then her name and, and nice. Almost second. like a, like a mission transfer board, right? That you yeah, see in mission of. present offices. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So she would have the companionship written on two different small sticky notes in a certain color. And then the people they minister to underneath that written, their names written on a sticky note in a different color. Oh, wow. So that was it. And then as we pull it out and she'd be like, okay, well, these are the chain, you know, so-and-so is moving or, or so-and-so needs a different route or this isn't working. We would talk about the things we had just found from our interviews. And then from that, we would pull out, okay, these are the changes that need to make. So then she would just turn the name sideways if it was someone that we needed to change. Um, oh, yeah. And then she would, if we decide, if we felt like, okay, this could go here, she'd move it sideways over there. So she knew it wasn't like permanent yet Uh and she needed to record it. Um, But it was over there and it was just a beautiful process because sometimes we'd pull out a name, this needs to make a change and we'd all just pause and we'd look at the board and there'd just be a quiet, you know, we said a prayer at the beginning of our meeting and we'd be guided by the spirit. And there were so many times when all of a sudden someone would say, what about with so-and-so and two or one other I was just thinking that and so it was like awesome like okay that's clear that's the spirit that wants that person with that person and there was other times where we'd be like what about this what about that and it would take like 10 minutes of discussion and it wasn't going anywhere and then sometimes Sharon Kay would be like "Mm, why don't we wait on this and give it some more thought and prayer for another week Mm -hmm. so it was just nice I love that Mm -hmm. and I love it that it's not you know we are in 2022, we're so obsessed with apps and digital methods. Mm-hmm. And I love just the analog approach of mm-hmm. good old post-it notes and a, mm-hmm. and a trifold board and, and mm-hmm. it worked, right? Yeah. So simple. It worked so well. It's so visual. I'm a really visual pe- person. We all are. So, yeah. And we did that yeah. same way with uh, picking our conference talks for lessons after we'd have general conference, she would have her breadboard with all the conference talks written on little sticky notes <laughs> on the breadboard. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> and we would all, cause we're sitting around the table and, and we would all just say like, this is my conference talk. We would say like, what are our top conference talks that came to mind? And the ones that we all felt like, okay, these are for sure. She would just put over to the side and then she'd be like, okay, now we need like 10 more or whatever. Look at the weeks of the next six months. And then, and then we would discuss more and then we kind of get to a place where like, oh, like, okay, well that's good. We have, about two thirds of it. Let's pray and listen to those talks again and come back next presence meeting and finish this up. So it wasn't awesome. ever like we have to have it all figured out at a certain mm-hmm. time. We just would go with the spirit and, and be in flow with it. And it was just yeah. a really beautiful process. Yeah. And then I just want to underscore the, the principle of like just having systems in place, whether it's uh, post-it notes or something digital or whatever, like mm-hmm. you had your system that you knew you'd come back to every time and you knew what you were looking at and you could probably get through, you know, make a lot of progress just because those systems were in mm-hmm. place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and also like as, as the president, there was things sometimes that she knew that we didn't know. And so maybe we'd come back to president's meeting and she'd be like, I put this person, I was really praying and I moved this person over here because such and such. And we'd be like, okay. Yeah. It's, yeah. And and I also want to add, like, this was one of the things I thought during her interview that we all are really strong personalities and we're very different. Like every decade was represented in our presidency. Our secretary was in her thirties. I was in my forties. Second counselor was in her fifties. Sherry Kay was in her sixties, like so oh, much cool. different life experience, but there was such a unity in our presidency because there was like this awesome balance of Sharon Kay would ask and we would share thoughts, opinions, feelings, whatever. Sometimes we went off on tangents and whatever, but at the end of the discussion, we all knew ultimately she is the president. We're not. And so just like we're taught to yield to the enticings of the Holy spirit, we would also do that yielding to the Holy spirit and also yielding to her as the president that ultimately she has the final say. And 
it was such a beautiful balance of there was never unrighteous dominion on her part of, but there was also a respect for that leadership as a president for her. So there wasn't ever like butting heads or contention or things like that, even though we had such um, diverse opinions. Yeah. Wow, I love it. Love it. Uh, so let's shift to just sort of your approach with uh, connecting with sisters, understanding family backgrounds and whatnot. You, talk, you mentioned in your in the notes you sent over as far as this, you know, how does, in, in our faith tradition and in, in all traditions, I think the, the humans put together, we have these, uh, sometimes they, they, uh, they turn into cliches or they turn into general statements that maybe don't fit everybody's situation and ours, we have them, right? Families can be together forever. I'm a child of God, you know, that he sent me to a home with parents kind and dear, right? And these things that uh, we, we are, we're great at rehearsing, but then someone may hear it and interpret it different than, than another one. So how did you, where do we start in this discussion as far as connecting with the sisters in Relief Society so that they didn't, so they had space for they may be the diverse background they had or the unique family situation they had Mm -hmm. that's so oh there's so much there right because we have sisters that are coming out of divorce and we have uh people that grew up in uh, abusive homes or dysfunctional homes of different varieties or different things like that like it's those are painful things like speaking from experience i i knew growing up that there were things I didn't understand what the things were in my home that weren't as happy as in other homes. And it was really difficult and tricky. And Hmm. then as I got older and I ended up going to counseling to um, figure out what in the world was (laughs) going on, I just, I knew there was a difference between how I was raised in the home that I wanted. And so I went to a lot of counseling and um, that was a, difficult, painful experience and also a a healing one that brought me closer to Christ. I had a beautiful um, therapist that was in LDS Social Services. It was a miracle that was one of the answers of why we came to Alaska of the long Mm. story part, which I didn't know, but God knew. (laughs) Um, And so I have that unique perspective that um, I would say a lot of people have, (laughs) that sometimes those can be painful things. Like I'm a child of God and he sent me to maybe, maybe parents weren't kind and dear. Maybe yeah. they were painful. Maybe they were difficult. Maybe they, uh, you had to get away from them. Like there's so many difficult, difficult, messy things in this more mortal life that we're all learning and figuring out. And we sometimes come from backgrounds of trauma and layers of trauma affect other things. And then there's personality disorders and there's just so much. And so I learned that, um, always to connect back to Christ. And when there's painful things that people don't understand or that are said with good intentions in songs that I can replace it with Christ. And so for example, um, I'm a child of God. He has sent me here and given me an earthly home and Christ is kind and dear. Mm. I have a family here on earth and Christ is so good to me. Yeah. Yeah. So what does this look like in the context of like Relief Society? I mean, do you offer these, these additional lyrics to some of the songs or whatnot, or, or how do you, how do you help people sort of wade through that when they don't feel like they're, they have an ideal background? Well, it's such a one-on-one work, right? And Mm. Sharon Kay talked about that in her interview, the listening and the validating. And, um, the thing that I kept bringing to the table was that I learned from my own experiences before I can move on to what I need to do with what has happened, I, it has to be validated that it was real and that it happened and that it was painful and that it wasn't okay. Hmm. And so um, a lot of times I think we want to give someone solutions. We're feeling bad that they're feeling bad and we want them to feel better. And so we're like, here, here, do this, or here's a scripture yeah. or, or here's a quote or whatever. Yeah. Let's fix it. Right. (laughs) Let's fix it. But that's like going from zero to 60. Like there's a lot in between that has to be listened to and validated and heard before you can get to that healing part. And, and also that it's their work. Like my work of sorting out my home I came from was my work with Christ. I had to do with counseling and I needed support and 
a little side note, Sharon Kay, that I didn't even know when I first moved here, became uh, someone that I took my kids to, to babysit while I went to counseling. She didn't Mm. even know what was happening, but she became a sister to me long before she was ever really started present. Um, And so um, we just need to listen to people and say, wow, that's a lot. That sounds so hard. I'm so sorry. Like what, how are you doing with that? Like, like just honor that it's hard and it's a lot and it's not fair and it's painful and, and that's okay. And you're not, you're not a person without faith because you're having a hard time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or because you're grieving. Like there's so much grieving, right? Like we have death, we have trauma, we have abuse, we have divorce, all that has to be grieved. And that doesn't mean we don't have faith because we're really sad or really mad. It means we're in the grief cycle and Christ can be in that grief cycle with us. We can invite him into that. He's been there. He knows. And so did a lot of these conversations, I imagine they came up during these, these informal ministering interviews that that you did. Right. Uh, And, and I think a lot of people, they, they want to be, whether they're in a relief society presidency or a elder scorn presidency, they want that interaction to happen, but maybe they sit down with somebody and there's just sort of that wall up, right. That, um, mm-hmm. they're, they're not letting you in like, sure. Mm-hmm. You can ask me about my families and yeah, I'm kind of visiting them, whatever, but, uh, mm-hmm. that's all, uh, that's as far as we're going in this conversation. Right. So mm-hmm. it, was it just a matter of, of time of meeting with them over and over again? Or like, how did, how did you get through that wall so that they would open mm-hmm. up to you? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think back to the beginning place of the interviews, it was, we were touching base. What's working, what isn't working. So Mm -hmm. from the beginning, we were setting up an equal groundwork of like, we're just checking in to see what's working and not working. We're not like I'm up here and are you doing a good enough job? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that created a place of equality where we're just human beings trying our best in mortality to connect to Christ and figure out this mortality. And so So, so it sounds like you really remove that dynamic of the the reporting dynamic. I'm not here to get your report or to see if you did it or not, but like what's working, right? Like you're just Mm -hmm. saying, we're just having a conversation here, right? We're Mm -hmm. not, I'm Mm -hmm. not looking for you to give me an A plus and oh no, Mm -hmm. you have to give me a B minus, right? We're just talking. Yeah. Yeah. And then from there we might say like, well, have you tried this or do you think this would work or, um, also, when that because that was set up, when we found out of a need later, we would text that person and be like, hey, did you know that so-and-so's husband just went in for surgery? Could you check in and see how they're doing? Like, hmm. So we already had that built up, and then we would pass it on to them with some specific information because we felt like people did better with specific information. Yeah. Um, and so, and we always, you know, kept it honoring confidentiality. Like, is it okay if I share this? Is it okay if I reach out and ask this? So that confidentiality was there. So the trust was there. And, um, and then, uh, you know, I, I I remember we had been working with a sister that, um, you know, had a lot of struggles, a lot of layers, and it's not something we can fix. And, um, but we always made sure that they knew they were loved. Like we would just always honor like the good that was happening, even though there was so much more that you know needed to happen like we just honored the good that was happening like you're doing such a good job with this thing or like wow I can see how hard that was but like you did that and like Mm -hmm. we would just cheer for them like I don't know I mean it was different individually but I guess it was just coming with a different mindset of like I'm not coming to give you answers I'm coming to listen and uh I guess connect like Sharon Kay also mentioned we were connectors. Mm, like that yeah. was such a big thing. It took load off us of like, Oh, we're the relief side presidency. We have to have everyone's answers. Instead. It's like, we got a lot more of the information of life situations. And so then, well, maybe so-and-so like it would be okay if I reach out to so-and-so. And so we were just a connector because we had a better pulse on different people in the ward. And then we would connect them with um, other people that might be helpful for that situation or would become a friend or make ministering changes because of that difficult conversation. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So I'm curious, like when you're in that moment where maybe somebody is opening up or just, you can, you can sense the overwhelm they're feeling or, you know, then it suddenly doesn't become about ministering assignments or anything. It's like, Oh, we're just, we're having a a heart to heart discussion here. mm -hmm. Do you have any like go-to questions or 
Um, you know, I know like some therapists use the question, like, tell me more about that or any, like, mm -hmm. so that you avoid the fix it mentality of like, mm -hmm. oh, you know, have you read your scriptures yet? Or like, mm -hmm, yeah. <laughs> or how, how, you know, have you gone to the temple about it or right. but to just any, any phrases or questions you to just like stay present with them in those moments where they're opening up? I think the two, and they're very simple, is simply what would help you feel supported what do you need right now? Mm -hmm. And what do you want to work on? Like, like if it was a work on thing, but, and I'll give an example of that. Like, um, there was a sister and, and she's, she's pretty open and she's given me permission to share this. So even though I'm not going to share her name, um, she knows. Sure. Her. Um, so she had a lot of layers of trauma in her life and, um, and was had a hoarding house. There was stuff everywhere. And as we, I started to listen and get to know her better. She started to express like how frustrated was she was. She couldn't find stuff. There was just stuff everywhere. And, um, and all these other layers of problems. And I said, well, what, where do you want to start? What, what would help? And she said, well, could we work on my kitchen? I said, okay, when do you want to do that? Like it's all her, right? Like mm -hmm. I'm not the one leading it. She has to be the one leading it. And, um, um, how about, you know, set a date, I came back. And so we just opened cupboards in the kitchen and there was like a million of water bottles and a million of this and a whole thing of like, um, garlic butters and a thing. And, and the whole time it was like, okay, how many water, I would just ask her questions how many water bottles do you feel like you need? Well, I don't know. Like, but it, my job was just asking questions and honoring the faith that she had to even step into this really painful, vulnerable space with me mm -hmm. because the stuff was, was connected to so much neglect and trauma from her childhood. And it was a really beautiful space to be there because I felt like the savior was there because she was stepping into that space and I was honoring it and just asking questions, mm -hmm. but she was leading it versus there's other times we've gone in and decided, Oh, we need to clean up this whole house because it's terrible and it's a terrible place for kids to live and whatever. And, but the person wasn't leading it. They didn't ask for it. They didn't want it. And so what do you know? It got back to that same level. It didn't ever, it, it wasn't healthy helping. It was codependent helping. Yeah. And so just that simple, what do you want? How could I support you? Would this, sometimes Sharon Kate, she has this wonderful way of saying, well, I had a thought and I don't know, but could I share this thought? Uh -huh. <laughs> and of course it's, those thoughts are from the spirit. Right. Uh -huh. But she's just so unassuming. She's like, I just had this thought. I wonder if I could share it. And always <laughs> the thought was so like to the core, to the point. And I've had her do that personally with me. Um, and so, it, but, it, but the way saying I had a thought isn't saying, I know what you should do with this thought. It's just, here's the thought. Yeah. I'm going to lay it down and you can decide whether you pick it up, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. Nice. But it's very honoring of and respectful of them. And so, um, do. as far as like, you know, asking them, what do they, you know, what, what is it that they need? And you mentioned that, you know, the term codependency, which I think more, some people might be familiar more than others. Um, so what is like when somebody has a need, what does responding that need codependently look like, which we don't want to do for, for those listening. Right. So what, what does that, what does code codependency look like in this context of, uh, of helping the sisters or in this church leadership dynamic? Well, I think that the first thing again is like they're in charge, they're leading what they want and what they need. And they're asking for that specific help versus a codependent would be enabling uh, unhealthy behavior so like if someone, um, you know, isn't taking care of their kids and their house is, is really, um, you know, there's stuff everywhere and uh, it's a disaster. Um, if we're going in and cleaning that up and that person is just sitting on the couch, th that's not healthy helping because they're mm -hmm. not engaged in that process. They're not learning. They're not doing, they're just sitting and, we had a really incredible tender mercy happen in our presidency when we were 
you know, you can kind of feel when like you're in these situations and you're like, oh, the kids are having such a hard time and I want to help. But like, we're not getting through to like, you know, the, the parent or whatever. And we don't know what to do about this. Right. And so we, we had a situation. Um, well, I guess two things, like we would always invite action. Like that's what God does. Right. He mm-hmm. invites action. President Nelson is so good at constantly inviting action. Here's a principle. Now invite you to action, you know, find out, pray about all these things. So we would invite action. Like, so we would say like, so do you think you could fill in the blank and they could say yes or no, but we would always invite action. So they were doing something on their part that even if, no matter how small that it was something they could do. Um, and so we had a situation where um, there was, it wasn't an emergency situation where sometimes you do just have to run in and help. It was a chronic ongoing thing. This pattern kept happening that um, the kids were, you know, being left without groceries and different things like that. And, um, the, we invited the, um, parent to do some planning ahead and do some action and that, um, turned, it backfired and they were offended and things like that. Mm -hmm. And we were really torn about like, did we do this right? What should we do? And we were all starting to feel like, ah, this is getting off balance, right? Because when you feel the spirit, you feel on balance when you don't you feel off balance. So it was feeling off balance. And we were all praying about like, what do we do about this situation? And the next morning I came down and I was reading through my son's school papers and he was like in second grade at the time. And there was just this really simple reading story that he had read for like phonics, whatever. And it was like the most crazy coincidental tender mercy that I brought to our presidency meeting. And we all just laughed and were like, wow, how does God do this? And so it was just a simple story of a man whose cart was stuck in the mud. And he looked around and he said, oh, there's a strong lady. I'm going to ask her for help. And she came over and started pushing the cart out of the mud. And he got on the cart and started yelling at her that she was doing it wrong. (laughs) And she said, wait a minute, I will help you push your cart out of the mud if you help me. And so he got out and helped her push the cart with her. And then they got the cart out of the mud and then he gave her a carrot and they went on their way. And so (laughs) that was like the magic thing is if someone wants their cart out of the mud, they need to be pushing with us. Hmm. Yeah. Not criticizing how we're doing it. And sometimes we have good intentions. We come in and we try to do too much because we love the person or we're concerned about the situation. But God honors our agency and we have to honor people's agency yeah. and goes back to the what do you want? Yeah. How do you want me to help? Yeah, I love that. And it's sort of, you know, you l- allow them to, yeah, you're asking them the question, letting them direct it. And I think another important con- component of, you know, avoiding that codependency is that if you're going to help them, you have to have it to give. So maybe this sister could have said, mm-hmm. well, I need you to come over for seven days all next week mm-hmm. and, and help me clean my entire house. You would say, well, I, I mean, I, I, I can't do that. I could come over on Saturday for three hours and help you mm-hmm. with your kitchen. Would that be helpful? Is that what you need? And then she would say yes or no, or because if you don't have it to give, sometimes we get in that dynamic of thinking like, oh, well, I'm the, in the release study pregnancy. I guess I have to do that. And then our mm-hmm. life becomes overwhelmed and we get drained and then we're help to nobody, especially our own family. Exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah. And exactly. And that's a really good point. We would also ask questions like, well, who have you already asked for help? Mm-hmm. Do you have extended family that could help? Like that was part of our questions was, who, what have you already done to help so that it could narrow down to what our part was, which wasn't everything. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember at, during my time serving as, as Bishop, we, have, we were in an inner city area and I sort of made the, the choice for all auxiliaries that we just, if somebody comes to us and help, asks us to, you know, we had a lot of low income individuals that had extremely messy houses. If they come to us and say, I need the relief society or the elders quorum to come and help us, 
uh, help me clean my house, we would just say, we just don't help clean houses. So you're going to have to figure something else out. I, I know some other words do that with moving. They say, Elders Quorum, our Elders Quorum is not a moving organization, so we can't help you move. You'll have to figure something else out. I think then this, this sort of this dance with boundaries and whatnot. And some mm-hmm. Elders Quorums or Relief Studies may hear that and be like, oh, that's crazy. You shouldn't do that. Well, mm-hmm. it, you know, each organization has to make these decisions in order to avoid this codependency of like, I don't think we can ever say no. And now we have to drain our people Mm -hmm. until Mm -hmm. there's nothing left. Right. Right. And that's where the ward council comes in too. Cause you know, we, we were happy to help people move. We do help people move, but there was a situation that was a huge move and it had not been planned ahead and it had been encouraged. Well, can you ask this? Can you ask this? And then it was like Saturday morning, like, Oh, we need 20 trucks. And we're like, (laughs) <laughs> yeah, we don't have that, right? <laughs> you know, you had been asked to call these people and, and we have few people that come for three hours and, and that's it. And so it's yeah. like, it's really a tricky balance with boundaries yeah. and allowing people to learn from their agency and their experience. Like that's what mortality Yeah, is. but always with love, like not trying to, we're not trying to teach a lesson. We're just trying to allow. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that helps the word thrive with, with, with any individual with good boundaries. That's what helps us thrive. Right. So, yeah. And again, it comes back to questions like, what have you tried? Who have you reached yeah. out to? What can you do? Well, can you do that? Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned, you know, going back to my question about, are there any go-to questions you ask when you're, you know, someone's opening up and needing help or talking about a tough situation, you talked about, you know, asking what do they need? Was there another question? I don't know if you mentioned it yet. What was, cause you said there were two main questions, but maybe we already talked about it. Yeah. Well, I think it was, and also what do you want? Okay. What do you need and what do you want? Okay. Because like Jesus did that all the time. In fact, I started to notice when anyone would come to him, whether they were blind, whether they were lame, whatever, he would always ask in some form or another, what do you want? Mm -hmm. Because he did not want to take away their agency. And so that's a really, really pivotal question. What do you want? Mm -hmm. And so back to my friend with the hoarding house, I asked her that question and she said, could you help me with my kitchen? Not the whole house, not the garage, not yeah, just the kitchen. That's what she wanted. That's the space she was able to go in. And so same thing, Jesus, always, what do you want? Yeah, that's powerful. Love it. Because, because that, that encourages us to use our agency and decide what we want. Sometimes it's easier to let someone else make a decision for you. But... I'm in charge of my life and I have to decide what I want. And that's my work with God. President Nelson has talked a lot about doing the spiritual work to receive personal revelation. That's my work. And I have to decide what I want and what I need and what my questions are. And then go specifically, I need this. Like God knows everything. He could shower us with everything. But he (laughs) waits till we ask for what we want and what we need. And then he's like, here you go. Mm. person tender mercy miracle and we recognize it because we've asked for it and we're engaged in it with him he honors that agency so much more older i get i realize yeah very insightful sarah that's that's awesome any other point or principle with as far as validating pain or offering help or um connecting families to christ anything that we haven't mentioned that you want to make sure we mention before we wrap up I think the grief cycle is really, really important for every leader to understand Hmm. that A, it's a thing. It's real. And anger is a part of it. And we, you know, we, we don't, you know, we try to be peaceful followers of Christ always and not act on anger. But there's a difference between feeling angry And that when someone is feeling angry because they've been violated, they've been betrayed, they've been lied to, they've been abused, that that is part of the grief process. And that is okay. And that needs to be honored and acknowledged. And um, I was so thrilled. So I I was uh, just finished facilitating for the emotional resilience course that the church just came out with. They've Mm -hmm. done a lot of like financial self-reliance, but now they have the emotional resilience one. And, oh, I was so thrilled about so many principles in there. And uh, I think it was unit week five. They talk about the grief cycle and it says that uh, anger, the level of anger, something, I'm not saying this exactly right, but the level of anger signifies the level of loss. Hmm. And so we just have to let people go through that, right? 
Yeah. Yeah. Say that makes sense that you're angry. That was horrible. That never yeah. should have happened. That yeah. that's not, you know, we we say things like, oh, like, you know, everything happens for a reason, blah, blah. And sometimes uh-huh. those things are so harmful because it's not God's will that people are abused or raped or right. betrayed. That is not God's will. That's part of our mortal experience. And that's why we have a savior who experienced betrayal and abuse, all of it. He felt it. He experienced it. So he knows how to succor us and comfort us. But it is not God's will that people are abused, raped, betrayed ever. Yeah. It, it's not. And so we really need to be careful that we don't say things like, well, everything happens for a reason. And, you know, <laughs> those phrases are just really yeah. not helpful. And that's why I appreciate these these questions or responses that you, you laid out. Just going back to the, you know, being present with them. Wow. Wow. I, I imagine that hurts. Mm-hmm. Tell me more about that. What do you need? What do you want? Mm-hmm. You know, and yeah. then from there, uh, things start to open up to yeah. just be present with them rather than, well, maybe I, I haven't given you enough quotes to convince you that something's happened for a reason. <laughs> maybe you need one more, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, we do. And, and even like we might have an experience that's similar, but like sometimes I've shared that when it maybe wasn't appropriate. Like maybe they weren't in space to even hear my experience. Maybe they just needed to be heard. And, you know, going back to our baptismal covenants, mourn with those who mourn, comfort those who stand in need of comfort. That's it. It's not fixing. It's not giving answers. Only Jesus has the answers and we have to seek for those answers with him or in therapy or in reading a book or whatever, but we have to be seeking that answer. But when someone like recently, someone shared with, I had been thinking about someone, thinking about someone, you know, you have these things and you don't know why. And you go and you like, I've been thinking about you. I, I, how are you? Like, and they shared this huge thing that was just like, Oh my gosh. Like it, it like punched my gut. And we just stood there crying together. And I was just like, that is so much grief. Yeah. Like, how are you dealing with that? Like, that's so much grief. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's so People helpful. I want that pain honored because I had so many times where I would share a difficult thing in my family and pe- people would minimize it like, well, you know, everything happens for a reason or like, well, it's not as bad as such and such. That's yeah. also a thing never to say. Yeah. <laughs> it's not, there's not comparative pain, right? Like pain is pain. And yes, there's always someone that has it worse, but that should not negate or minimize our pain or someone else's pain. Yeah. And Christ does not have this sliding scale of like, well, your pain is not as bad as so-and-so. So I'm only going to help you this much because that person, like <laughs> none of that, right? Like Christ comes to us in all of our pain and all of its colors and layers and messinesses. Yeah. And he's okay with the anger and the, all of it. Like we don't have to come to him with like, well, thank you for this day. And please help us to get home safely. Like, no, <laughs> we don't need to be a certain mold. We can just be really real and honest. Yeah. And, and that's what I loved about our presidencies. I feel like they were so a bit of Zion, like Sharon Kay's husband would say, well, is your party happening today? He called it her parties because uh-huh. we were always laughing and crying and sharing and, and messy and working through our own stuff too. And like, how does it all connect? And so none of us have the answers. Only Christ does, but we can ask questions like he does and listen and love and honor the progress people are making the baby steps. Sharon Kay was so good at honoring, like, well, you know, comparing that person to that person. Not like, what is their problem? Like, uh, how hard is it to clean the garage, right? Like, no. (laughs) Everyone has their own layers of trauma that are connected to different things that we don't know. And so if we step into that messy space, we can only step into it with love and kindness and listening and asking and honoring agency. Well, Sarah, this has been fantastic. I'm so glad we did this follow-up. We don't do too many follow-up, uh, you know, how I lead interviews, but uh, man, if, if I had the time and the 
the bandwidth. I would love to interview every single presidency in this church ever. And uh, there's just so much to, to learn from. Them. So I appreciate you uh, reaching out and uh, I'm glad we made this possible. And I learned even, even more uh, from you as, as I did from uh, Sharon Kay. So last question I have for you, Sarah, is as you reflect on your time as a leader, how has being a leader helped you become a better follower of Jesus Christ? Hmm. Oh, I love that so much. Um, I guess maybe back to what I started saying is like that really he's the light. He's, he has overcome the world. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And so, you know, as a leader, you have really heavy stuff that you learn about. And I've learned that it's not up to me to carry it. It's up to because he carries it. But I have to be humble enough to go to him and say, okay, here's this really heavy, painful thing. How do you, what's your, what do you want me to do with it? What's, what's your part and what's my part? And he knows that. And he has all the answers. And I'm so grateful that he is the light of the world and has overcome everything. And that concludes this How I Lead interview. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I would ask you, could you take a minute and drop this link in an email, on social media, in a text, wherever it makes the most sense, and share it with somebody who could relate to this this experience. And this is how we, how we develop as leaders, just hearing what the other guy's doing, trying some things out, testing, adjusting for your area. And uh, that's... That's where great leadership's discovered, right? So we would love to have you uh, share this with uh, somebody in this calling or a related calling, and that would be great. And also, if you know somebody, uh, any type of leader, who would be a fantastic guest on the How I Lead segment, uh, reach out to us. Go to leadingsaints.org slash contact. Maybe send this in individual an email letting them know that you're going to be suggesting their name for this interview. We'll reach out to them and uh, see if we can line them up. So again, go to leadingsaints.org slash contact, and there you can submit all the information and let us know. And maybe they will be on a future How I Lead segment on the Leading Saints podcast. And remember, to get on the email newsletter list, simply go to leadingsaints.org slash 14. It came as a result of the position of leadership which was imposed upon us by the God of heaven who brought forth a restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when the declaration was made concerning the own and only true and living church upon the face of the earth, we were immediately put in a position of loneliness, the loneliness of leadership from which we cannot shrink nor run away and to which we must face up with boldness and courage and ability.